Welcome to Coaster Mania. I'm Micah. I want you to know something about me. I believe Wildcat's Revenge is the best roller coaster at Hershey Park and is even better than Skyrush. If that's all you needed to hear, then there you go. If this makes you curious as to why, stay tuned. This coaster is completely insane and at points feels like it takes a hell diver to withstand its onslaught of elements. So without further ado, let's dive into this review. Hot launch initiated. In my previous roller coaster reviews, I broke down the videos into different segments. These included theming, layout, capacity, trains, and the overall ride experience. Wildcat's Revenge has no real theming beyond the train, so I'm going to nix that segment and instead replace it later in the video with specific reasons why I think it's better than Skyrush. Making these videos for you guys takes a lot of work, so I really appreciate all of the support you are giving me. Every like, view, comment, and subscription really helps me out a lot. But if you feel like helping me out a little bit further, check out my Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can help me in my journey to bring even more of this high quality content to you guys. Moving on to the coaster itself, Wildcast Revenge is the reimagining of the first roller coaster built by GCI and was one of the first major projects designed by Joe Draves on his own while working with RMC. Opened in the summer of 2023, Wildcat's Revenge continues the trend of not so creatively named roller coasters that have been enhanced by RMC. This coaster stands at 140 feet tall and traverses its 3,510 feet of track in two and a half minutes. I can count on one hand the number of enthusiasts who were disappointed that this coaster wasn't refurbished by GCI, but in my opinion, these people are wrong to be unhappy with this coaster. Even with its moderate height, it manages to pack a lot into the layout that makes great use of what speed it has. Wildcat's Revenge fits into the next phase of Rocky Mount Construction's roller coaster lineup. This can be seen in the changes to the support structure, as well as in the design language of the course, at least slightly. When I'm talking about the change in support structure, I'm talking about the extra things RMC is now doing to reinforce their coasters. On both Iron Gwazi and Wildcat's Revenge, extra steel supports have been added to add more strength to the existing superstructure. This has been done in particularly high stress areas as a means to assist the existing support structure in dealing with the higher forces the ride will experience. These paint a picture of a more mature manufacturer as some of their earlier coasters have had issues with their structures. Moving on from this, as I mentioned in the intro, Wildcat's Revenge is one of Joe Drave's first completely independent projects without guidance from Alan Schilke. To say the least, his design language fits right in with the rest of the RMC lineup and, in my opinion, even manages to surpass some of their past coasters as well. Now that we have a little bit of background on what this coaster is, let's actually start reviewing it. I can't say that the layout of Wildcat's Revenge is completely original. It mostly follows the original layout of Wildcat, but deviates in a few key ways. For one thing, the lift hill is much steeper, and the pre-lift section is a decent bit longer as well. Where this ride excels is its variety of elements. When it comes to the overall layout, this ride feels like a complete buffet. Coming right out of the station, you go into one of the better pre-lift sections on an RMC I've experienced. The only other one that is comparable that I've been on is the pre-lift on Twisted Colossus. Right after this, you start going up the lift hill which passes right under a zero-g roll. After going down the first drop, which kicks a lot more than you think it should, considering that it's only 82 degrees, is followed up by the mouthful of an element that is the step up underflip. I personally didn't expect much of this element, but got a surprising amount of whip from it. After leveling out from this turn, you are met with the first airtime hill. This hill does a great job at ejecting you out of your seat no matter which row you're in. Following this is a twisted double up that transitions into a wave turn. 
This pop-up launches you out of your seat, especially if you're in the left side of the train. The following wave turn will eject just about anyone from their seat right after this, for a decent amount of time, I might add. Next up is my second favorite element from this ride, the Zero-G stall. Unlike on some rides, the speed as you crest on this stall is just right that it provides a good sense of hang time while not being over too quickly. After flipping your world back right side up, the ride turns into its next wave turn. After completing that beyond 180 degree turnaround, the ride violently pops up into a surprising airtime moment that's followed by an unbanked turn that jolts the train to the left. This then pops you quickly back up to eject you back out of your seat before making your way down another hill. This right here was my favorite part of the ride. With how sudden the unbanked turn is between the two airtime hills, you really aren't given a chance to settle from one element to the next. Following this is the first zero G roll, which flies over the second. After a decently long turnaround that is broken up by yet another wave turn, you experience the second zero G roll, which threads the needle between the lift hill and the first zero G roll. Coming into the end of the ride, we hit our final wave turn, a twisted airtime hill, and then another quick pop up into the final breaks. But wait, suddenly, there's another unbanked turn. Despite how many times Katie and I rode this, we were never able to prepare for this final unbanked turn. You are ejected out of your seat right before this, then thrown directly to the side as the train turns right underneath you. To put it lightly, this ride is a non-stop buffet of elements that never truly lets up. No matter how many times you ride it, there are still points that you just can't fully prepare for. This ride moves from one element to the other so quickly that it's almost a miracle that we're even able to see where one element ends and another begins. Unlike a lot of other RMCs, which seem to suffer from repetitive elements, this ride keeps it varied with a huge mix of laterals, airtime, hangtime, and positive Gs as well. Overall, I'd rate the layout of Wildcat's Revenge a 10 out of 10. This is one aspect of this ride that I was somewhat surprised by. Here's why. Most of the other coasters at Hershey Park had less than stellar operations. It's most likely because this is their newest ride, and because it did have longer lines, but the operations on it were actually flying. So much so that the variable speed lift hill had to keep one train running at low speed so as to not block check. The other insane thing to me was the fact that most of the times we were riding, the second train was going through the zero G roll that passes right over the lift hill at the same point that our train was passing under it. This was something I wasn't anticipating as possible, but it was amazing and added even more to the experience. On to some actual numbers. The three trains on this coaster each have six cars. Each car has a two x two seating arrangement for a total capacity of 24 riders per train. If Wildcat's Revenge dispatches one train per minute, we can factor that into the overall ride duration, which, based on this POV, should land at 2 minutes and 31 seconds. With the dispatch, this would mean a total duration of 3 minutes and 31 seconds, which will be represented by D for duration, in decimal form. Moving on, this coaster has 3 trains, which will be represented by T for trains. We then must add in the amount of people that can fit in each train, which is 24. This variable will be represented with the letter C for capacity. Finally, the variable we're solving for, throughput, will be represented with the letter P for people. So by using this equation, P equals C over D times 60 times T, we get P equals 24 over 3.51 times 60 times 3. By solving this equation, we get a theoretical capacity of roughly 1,230 people per hour. Theory is great and all, but in practice, with the one and a half minute dispatches we regularly saw, this would mean that we would have a theoretical capacity of 1,074 riders per hour, which, to be fair, is not that far off the mark. Looking at how quickly the line often moved for this ride, it's no surprise that they were able to keep up with this throughput. Overall, I'd rate the capacity an 8 out of 10. I honestly do not have much to say about the trains on this ride that I haven't previously said. These are your standard fare RMC trains. They're comfortable and allow for enough room to experience the bulk of the airtime. Honestly though, this is one of the few aspects of this ride that I have something remotely negative to say. That would be the decorations on the train. The sides and the back look fine, but the front? It's cursed. 
I prefer my roller coaster trains to be nice and symmetrical, not this. It doesn't help that the artwork on the front of these trains is what it is, but at least you can't really see this when you're riding the coaster. Overall, I'd rate the trains an 8.5 out of 10. As I stated partially in the layout segment, this ride is relentless the entire way through. It's smooth, fast, and feels like it makes good use of its height and speed. There genuinely isn't any complaints I have on this front. The only negative that I do have is the lack of theming. I know not all rides need to be themed, and let's face it, Hershey Park doesn't really theme their rides. It just might be nice if something was added here to give a little bit more flavor to the ride experience. I don't really believe I have much else to add here that I haven't already said. This ride truly is the whole enchilada, the hometown buffet, the whole kit and caboodle. In fact, this is probably one of the most aggressive RMC coasters I think I've ever ridden. So I'd rate the overall ride experience a 9.5 out of 10. Trigger warning, Skyrush has been dethroned and I can stand by that fact. I've got the numbers to prove it. If you haven't already, I know this is the point where you're probably going to write some long-winded comment oozing with vitriol with how wrong I am about this. All I have to say to that is, how cute. Sit back, cause I'm about to learn ya why Wildcat's Revenge mops the floor with Skyrush. Let's start with comfort. Skyrush used to be much worse in this department. Nowadays, it's much better, but uh, Wildcat's Revenge got it right the first time. Height and speed. Sure, I'll hand this one to Skyrush. With 200 feet and a top speed of 75 miles per hour, compared to Wildcat's 140 foot max height and 62 mile per hour top speed, yeah, sure, it wins. Once. Skyrush sort of wins in track length with its 3600 feet of track compared to Wildcat's 3510 feet. Kind of shocking though. Sure it's a win, but only by 90 feet? Surely the ride could have had a lot more with all the speed it's still carrying into the final breaks. Now onto the main course of this lesson, side-by-side -side layout comparison. I swear, Skyrush feels like I'm in a NASCAR race. It's fast, but all you're doing is turning half the time. So let's count the elements. Out of the station, Skyrush goes up a lift hill, then down its first drop. From here, you make a right turn, which transitions into the first airtime hill. Don't get me wrong, you get a ton of positive Gs in this turn and airtime over the hill. Next, we have a left turn, which turns and turns, still turning. Uh, oh, airtime hill. Prepare to get ejected. Like a lot. All right, airtime's over. Turning time again. How about a right turn again? Oh, and just to make sure you're not falling asleep, let's throw in a wave turn at the very end of it. After sneaking left a bit, you get to turn right again and keep turning until a rise up where we snake left again. Here we get a smaller pop of airtime followed by a rising left turn, and then a final pop of airtime into the brakes. Whoopee! So in 3600 feet of track, we have 15 elements if you include the lift hill and final brakes, according to this list. Now let's compare this to the list of elements on Wildcat's Revenge. Hmm. So you're telling me that a ride that is 90 feet shorter has 100 feet less of track length and a top speed roughly 10 miles per hour slower is able to fit in almost double the elements? Not looking too good there, Skyrush. Now how about the forces? To make this easier, I'm highlighting all of the elements based on what forces they provide. Green means airtime, blue means positive Gs, red means laterals, and yellow means hang time. For the elements that don't really provide much, we'll leave them white. So, with zero inversions, it makes sense the Skyrush doesn't provide hang time at all. And, like I said, Skyrush just kind of turns and turns and turns while Wildcat is a buffet. Don't get me wrong, Skyrush has extremely strong forces, but it feels kind of like a two-trick pony to me. Looking a little deeper here though, Skyrush almost feels formulaic in its approach, whereas Wildcat has a much more varied and out-of-control experience. You just get more bang for your buck. Let's double down even further. After doing some measurements and math befitting of an Airtime Thrills video, using Google Maps, subtracting the track length on the lift hill, brakes, and in the station, 
I have deduced that Wildcat's Revenge has roughly 3,037 feet of prime ride track, whereas Skyrush has 2,874.05 feet. Moreover, for prime ride time, from the moment it gains speed to the moment it hits the brakes, Skyrush has 44 seconds, while Wildcat has one full minute. Yes, it traverses its tracks slower, but with nearly double the elements over a period of time that lasts about 15 seconds longer? Yeah. So to sum it all up, in my subjective opinion, Wildcat's Revenge is objectively better than Skyrush. It does a lot more with what it has, and it just feels a lot more varied. Not only does Wildcat have a great layout, but it may even be able to be argued that it's one of the best layouts. Comparing it to other RMCs, this ride succeeds in the fact that it is not repetitive. Many other RMCs of old have trended towards more repetitive layouts with tons of bunny hills, but not this one. It really is interesting to see the difference in design philosophy that Joe Drave shows compared to Alan Schilke's designs. This coaster truly is one of the greats, and I can't wait to see what else this new designer has in store for us. To put it lightly, Wildcat's Revenge is an amazing addition to Hershey Park's lineup. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to leave a like and comment below and hit that bell icon. Special thanks to our Patreon supporter, Future Collective. $1 a month helps me bring even more content to you guys, and I even have some exclusive content coming, so check it out. Check the description below to find links to the rest of our pages. Thanks for watching the video and ride on, Coaster Maniacs.